In the summer of 1943, under a sky heavy with dust, a captured German Tiger tank was hauled into a British compound. Its armour was gashed open by shell fire, its interior a ruin of twisted metal. To most, it was a carcass of war. To a small circle of engineers, it was a specimen, a puzzle of steel, oil and secrecy. Within weeks, sections of the tank were shipped north, not to a museum, but to a discreet facility where the British War Office would dissect every bolt, gear and weld. This was not an act of triumph, it was an act of study, the beginning of Britain's quiet war against the machines of Hitler's empire. By early 1943, reports from Tunisia told of an enemy machine beyond expectation. British Sherman crews, long accustomed to duelling with Panzer IVs, suddenly found their rounds glancing harmlessly from a new form, the Tiger One. Its 88mm gun could destroy Allied armour at two kilometres. Its armour, thick and precisely angled, seemed impervious. Each encounter ended the same way. A sudden flash on the horizon, a plume of smoke, and silence. The War Office knew this was no ordinary evolution. The Tiger represented a different philosophy, one of over-engineered perfection, built not for speed, but for domination. Britain's factories could not simply build more tanks, they had to build better understanding. In London, meetings turned urgent. Reports from the front were pinned beside metallurgical graphs and armour penetration charts. Intelligence officers from Cairo sent fragments of destroyed tigers home. A broken wheel, a bent torsion bar, a steel plate scarred by shellfire. They arrived wrapped in canvas, labelled for analysis. At first, the work fell to existing laboratories, the Royal Aircraft Establishment, the National Physical Laboratory and the metallurgists at Woolwich Arsenal. But their equipment was stretched thin. They needed a new facility, discreet and wholly devoted to the enemy's engineering. By spring, under a veil of civilian designation, a factory in northern England was repurposed. Its cover name was Mundane, Department for Mechanical Assessment. Inside, it became Britain's secret autopsy table for the machines of the Reich. Women filled its drafting offices, charting alloy composition and impact tests, Men with lathes prepared cross-sections of armour plate. Every fragment told a story. The quality of German steel, the precision of their heat treatment, the weaknesses that lay hidden in the welding seams. This was the true beginning of the factory that dissected Hitler's tanks, not an act of vengeance, but of comprehension. The factory's purpose was born of pragmatism, not prestige. The Ministry of Supply authorised it quietly, attached to the Directorate of Tank Design. The task? Examine captured German tanks down to their smallest component. The engineers chosen were not soldiers. They were metallurgists, draftsmen and toolmakers, the invisible front of the industrial war. Among them was Dr William Rowe, a mild-mannered material scientist from Sheffield, who had spent peacetime studying fatigue in turbine blades. Now his expertise would be turned to understanding the durability of a tiger's gears. Blueprints of captured German gearboxes arrived from Cairo. The drawings revealed an astonishing truth. Every tiger's gearbox contained over 700 moving parts. The steel was not common carbon, but alloyed with molybdenum and nickel metals scarce even in Britain's best mills. Rowe wrote in his notebook, the enemy builds as if for eternity. But in that philosophy lay weakness. Perfection took time. Precision meant fragility under strain. Britain's vision, therefore, was to learn and simplify. In the upper rooms, technicians reproduced German diagrams. On the ground floor, machine tools were adapted to cut through armour plate up to four inches thick. Every test was logged, every sound noted. 
the groan of the lathe, the dull ring of fractured steel. No sign outside the gates revealed what was being done. Workers entered under the pretext of component evaluation. A single corridor led to the heart of the operation, a reinforced chamber where captured transmissions were suspended in chains and opened like clockwork hearts. Building a facility capable of dissecting German armour required tools few had seen. Industrial lathes were modified to handle components the size of railway axles. The smell of cutting oil mixed with that of burnt paint from the captured parts. From a distance, it looked like any other wartime workshop. Sparks, noise, routine. But up close, the work had the precision of surgery. A Tiger's Maybach engine, shipped from Tunisia, was set upon a reinforced test bed. It was still coated in desert dust. When the flywheel first turned under British hands, the room filled with a deep, deliberate rumble. Power meant to crush cities. Rows of engineers measured tolerances, comparing them to British equivalents. The Germans machined their crankshafts to a tolerance of two thousandths of an inch, a feat rarely attempted in mass production. To British minds, this was both brilliance and folly. Each Tiger took over 300,000 man-hours to produce. The British Cromwell, by comparison, took a fraction. In notebooks, notes were scribbled, excellence without economy. In one test, a gearbox tooth was placed in the jaws of an Amsler testing machine. Slowly, the hydraulic pistons applied pressure until the gear snapped. The fracture was clean, crystalline, a sign of exceptional steel. Yet, under repetitive stress, the same alloy showed brittleness. Every result was catalogued, every specimen photographed. This was science in service of survival. By autumn, complete vehicles began arriving. The first was Tiger 131, captured intact at Jebel Jaffa. It was driven under its own power onto a transporter and shipped to Britain. At the test ground, the Tiger dwarfed the Cromwell tanks parked beside it. Its turret moved with glacial precision. Engineers stood in silence as the Maybach engine was started, its note low, almost orchestral. Then the tests began. Fuel consumption was measured, gear changes timed, braking distances logged. It was a triumph of engineering, yet not beyond understanding. The Tiger could turn only within wide arcs, its transmission overheated after extended travel. Inside the factory, components were removed and replaced under observation. When stripped, the Tiger revealed its philosophy complexity layered upon complexity. For every advantage, a vulnerability emerged. Gears ground themselves smooth if unlubricated. The torsion bars, though elegant, failed under extreme cold. The British team compiled a dossier. Evaluation of German heavy tank number. 131. Its conclusions were clinical. The Tiger was formidable but inefficient. Its power came at the price of reliability. Yet in that inefficiency lay genius. It forced Britain to rethink its own designs. By 1944, the findings from the secret factory had spread quietly through Britain's design bureaus. Metallurgists concluded that the German method of case-hardening armour produced a surface resilient to direct fire but brittle under repeated shock. British foundries modified their own heat treatments accordingly. Engineers at Leyland examined the Tiger's gearbox and produced simplified prototypes. Fewer parts, easier to maintain, resistant to dust. Even the concept of sloped armour, previously underused in British tanks, gained new attention after measurements of German glacis angles were charted. The breakthrough was not in copying, but in learning restraint. Where the Tiger represented mastery through precision, Britain sought reliability through tolerance. Every chart, every fracture map, became a mirror of two industrial philosophies, the pursuit of perfection and the pursuit of practicality. By the time Allied tanks rolled into Normandy, their steel owed quiet credit to the dissected Tigers of 1943. Beyond the walls of the factory, the nation bore its own strain, 
Every discovery demanded resources, metals, testing equipment, precision gauges, drawn from a war economy already stretched to its limit. In the Midlands, women laboured under banners promising victory through production. Posters urged the collection of scrap and paper to fuel the research. Each rivet tested in secrecy had a cost in public sacrifice. The work also revealed unsettling truths about the enemy's industry. German metallurgy, though advanced, relied on forced labour and mines worked under brutality. The brilliance of the tiger's steel came from darkness deeper than any furnace. Inside the British facility, no one spoke of it. The data was all that mattered. But when peace came, some of the scientists would reflect uneasily. That knowledge can be drawn from horror as well as ingenuity. After the war, the secret factory's work was quietly archived. Many of its engineers returned to industry, their notebooks sealed for decades. Tiger 131 was preserved at Bovington, where it remains the only operational Tiger in existence. Its engine still carries the scars of British examination. In time, the lessons drawn from its dissection shaped the next generation of tanks. The Centurion, then the Chieftain, and finally the Challenger, each built on the same principle, endurance before excess. Today, when British engineers design modern battle tanks, they still trace lineage to those hidden years of analysis and experiment. The precision of the Tiger became the cautionary tale, its defeat, a study in adaptation. What was once enemy machinery became, through patient observation, the foundation of a nation's technical resilience. In a photograph taken at Beja in April 1943, a tiger lies destroyed beside the road, its turret is twisted, its gun at rest. The image endures not as triumph, but as testimony. For every captured tank, there were months of study, thousands of measurements, and the silent persistence of those who sought understanding over vengeance. In later years, when museum visitors gaze at the preserved tigers and panthers, they see the armour of an empire undone by its own intricacy. But behind each relic stands the unseen labour of Britain's secret factory, a place where knowledge became its own form of weapon. War leaves wreckage, study transforms it. And in the echo of gears once built for conquest, Britain found the quiet strength of comprehension.